the Messiah comes, Rome will be nothing! Until then. Risen is a powerful movie that centers around the events of the crucifixion of Jesus of Nazareth. You will lose peace and order if it's true. Kill him. Tribune, Pilate summons you. The body has vanished. His tomb is empty. It also features another unfathomable mystery. The shroud that wrapped his body in the tomb. Some believe this shroud survives to this day in Turin, as perhaps would many more, but for an event that occurred in 1988. An event that now looks like a grave miscarriage of justice. What frightens you? Imran. You tell me. What most moved the pilgrims who flocked to see the shroud was the ghostly imprint of a man laid out in death with the wounds of a crucifixion. Today, it rests in Turin Cathedral, undisturbed and unseen for years at a time in a bomb-proof case. Its survival is its own miracle. These scars are burns from a fire in 1532. Somehow, the damage left the image virtually unscathed. The front and back of a body have left an imprint, as if the body had been wrapped like this. This image became even more significant when it was exposed to the new science of photography. This early process involved an intermediary stage when light and shade were reversed to create a negative. Lo and behold, the shadowy image became much more striking as later and better photographs of the whole cloth confirmed. Would science be able to unlock its secrets? Eventually, these images arrived for inspection by forensic pathologists. To a person experienced in the examination of injuries, this is a particularly interesting case. And the cloth itself was subjected to the most minute scientific scrutiny by the American-led Shroud of Turin research project, known as STIRP. Could it possibly be genuine? The distinctive herringbone weave could easily be 2,000 years old and from the Middle East. The stains are real blood. The scourge wounds are consistent with the flagrum used by the Romans. There are puncture wounds you would expect from a crucifixion but not through the palms as artists always imagined, but through the wrists, which is the only place that would take the weight of a body and where, through archeology, span we now know the Romans nailed. Crucifixion was designed to cause maximum pain by forcing the victim to push down on the nailed feet to raise the chest in order to breathe. Death, when it came, was usually by suffocation. These two positions are confirmed by the angles of the blood flows. Where these two divergent streams are vertical as a result of gravity. The image is not paint or of any other known process. And somehow, it does not penetrate into the cloth, but sits on the topmost fibrils and is measured in nanometers. Charting iconography, 
Historians filled in the gaps to give the cloth in Turin a possible provenance all the way back to the Middle East of the first century. Microscopic pollen grains embedded in the fibrils appear to confirm this geographical trail. And there was more. Whatever had produced the image had done it in a way that allowed new density scanning machines to reveal a unique 3D gradation along its entire length. The world took notice. Was it possible that Jesus of Nazareth had left an image of himself lying in the tomb? The first selfie? The Dead Sea Scrolls had recently been validated by a carbon-14 test as being 2,000 years old, a clamour to apply the test to the shroud built, and, eventually, the Vatican began to assemble a team to consider it. Wisely, the team would include archaeologists, the scientists who work with C-14 day to day. William Meacham, here on the right, was selected and attended the first meeting in Turin on the 28th of September 1986. Every competent archaeologist knows that C-14 dating is not an infallible technique. In most cases it does produce a valid date, as for example the Dead Sea Scrolls. But the Dead Sea Scrolls had been stored in clay jars, undisturbed, in a cave for the intervening millennia. The shroud, on the other hand, was missing for centuries in unknown environments. Then it was handled by hundreds, possibly thousands of workers, pilgrims, clerics, in very unsanitary times, in extremely different climates, in CO2-rich and high-humidity atmospheres. It was even boiled in oil, according to one text. And the most important, in my view, it was burnt in a fire centuries after it was manufactured. Now, one can never be certain that material of more recent age has not been trapped in the structure of the cellulose, that some skilled repair was not done on the edges, that isotope exchange has not taken place. It is absurd to trust C-14 to produce an absolute calendar age for such an object. With this advice in mind, five protocols were established to ensure the test would be as definitive as possible. Multiple sample areas, a simultaneous comprehensive examination led by STIRP that would also ensure the most suitable sample areas were chosen, all seven major C14 labs to be given samples. The tests would be blind to the labs. They would be given linen from the shroud and control samples, but not told which was which. No conferring between the labs, and the results would be published by Turin when all tests were complete. A New York lawyer and author of The Quantum Christ, John Klotz, has made a study of what happened next. Dating the shroud would validate the C-14 lab's new AMS process and turn it into a commercial gold mine. They wanted that badly, but Sturp's participation was a problem. The labs needed the spotlight for themselves. They wanted Sturp eliminated from the process. Professor Carlos Chagas, head of the Pontifical Academy of Science, sided with the labs and convinced Pope John Paul that the multiple tests Sturt put forward carried risk for the safety of the shroud, which the single C-14 test did not. That was bunk, but Chagas carried the day Sturt was out. Apart from losing Sturt's wide-ranging program of tests, the selection of the sample for testing would be made without the input of the only scientist that had thoroughly analyzed the cloth and its composition. But the worst was yet to come. Much worse. One comes from Egypt uh, and dates to about the first century AD. Dr. Michael Tite, head of research at the British Museum, was appointed as independent adjudicator. He was also charged with locating control samples of other linens to ensure that the test could be carried out blind. This proved impossible. This crucial detail was swept under the carpet, but it meant that the blind test protocol was secretly scrapped. 
Professor Luigi Garnella from Turin University was placed in direct control of the C-14 tests, as he had been for Sterp's previous examination. This had only involved non-destructive testing, but C-14 is different. The sample is not big, but it is a destructive test, so <clears throat> the problem was to, how to say, to balance the amount of information and the amount of damage. Despite the protocols, Garnella decided to restrict the testing to a single sample area. Another protocol scrapped. This made the sample selection process even more critical. But the STIRP team, who could best advise on site selection, had been vetoed. Another protocol scrapped. For technical and political reasons, Michael Tight agreed that four of the original seven labs selected would be dropped. Another protocol scrapped. With the accumulation of these decisions, any possibility for the Turin authorities to coordinate publication of the results and to keep the labs from conferring was lost. The last protocol disappeared by default. So why, with all the protocols to make sure the test was definitive abandoned, did the test go ahead? The Vatican was in a difficult position. There was simply too much momentum. So they let the process continue, my worst fears played out, and a great injustice was done to the shroud. The C-14 dating cannot be definitive, especially since they took the only sample from just about the worst possible place. One thing we know for certain, the shroud was kept folded or rolled, and whenever it was shown, which was often, it had to be held up. The only practical way was for it to be clutched along the edge and corners for hours on end, often in stifling heat. This most famous and holy of all relics made personal contact with it a powerful quest for anyone who had access, and they took every advantage. Wear and tear was inevitable. So, when the time finally came, where would they decide to take the single sample from? Looking on were not those best qualified to judge, but the heads of the C-14 labs whose machinations had left them in pole position. They chose the worst possible place. A corner, an area most likely to have needed the kind of repair that we now know took place down the centuries. British researcher Pam Moon has recently shown that it should have been self-evident to those taking the sample that the chosen location was completely inappropriate. This is an image that was taken immediately after the carbon-14 sample had been cut from the Shroud of Turin, and you can see the cut here. What's interesting is that this is the backing cloth that it rested on, and you can see two different colours in the backing cloth. This is the, a colour of unbleached cotton, and here is a more orangey colour, which is artificial. What's interesting is that the shroud is the same colour as this artificial coloration on the backing cloth. This is another angle of the C14 sample being cut. This is the natural colour of the shroud linen, but the corner area was discoloured by proximity to these burns. It would be natural for any repairs here to be made to blend in. We know the shroud needed repair and was repaired from time to time. Researchers like Joe Marino and Sue Benford in the States and Donna Campbell from Thomas Ferguson Irish Linen found inconsistencies and reweave in the corner. Maybe the shroud was also dyed, both the, the corner and the backing cloth. I knew that Ray Rogers, a member of Sturp, found evidence of madder root on some fibres taken from the same area as the C14 sample. I went to see an expert on dyes and dyeing, Teresina Roberts, okay, at her so studio in Birmingham to, to see what this might mean. Um, Ray Rogers found that there was madder root dye in the corner. Teresina showed me the madder root that bears the colour. And gum tragacanth used to make it stick to the fabric. And the chemical alum that is used to make the cloth receptive and absorb the dye. 
She also demonstrated how easy it is to work with and match to any shade. So you need to leave it for two months and then the dye will be permanently bonded with the fibres. It won't come off. Ray Rogers had found evidence of all three substances on the fibres. This is a close-up of the C14 sample given to Oxford for testing, which has only just recently been released. There is a visible frosting of minute bubbles of gum. These would not have been apparent when the sample was taken, but even if they had, the labs would not have been too worried, as the sample would be treated with an acid solution designed to remove the contaminants. We know the dilution used. Most significantly, Rogers found that the acid solution required to remove the dye and gum from the threads was much higher. Rogers also found cotton interwoven with the linen, affirming the repair hypothesis. This would also serve to produce a much younger date if, undetected, it was included within the sample to be tested. I think we can now be absolutely certain that by allowing these all-important protocols to be abandoned, they really did choose the worst possible place to take the one and only sample for C14 testing. Professor Christopher Ramsey is the current head of the Oxford Radiocarbon Unit. With the radiocarbon measurements and with all of the other evidence which we have about the shroud, there does seem to be a, a conflict in the, in the interpretation of the different evidence. And for that reason, I think that everyone who's worked in this area, the radiocarbon scientists and all of the other experts, um, need to have a critical look of the evidence that they've come up with in order for us to try to work out some kind of a coherent story that fits um, and tells us the truth of the history of this intriguing cloth. Professor Ramsey, as a student, was present in the lab when the Shroud C14 test was done. But it was his boss, Professor Edward Hall, who was in Turin to receive the sample for testing. The wait is nearly over. If the different samples look similar, no laboratory will know for sure which is the shroud. Hall already knew this was a farce, as Michael Tite had failed to find controls that could not be distinguished from the shroud's herringbone linen. Shroud sample and its fate were now both sealed. When Hall chalked this medieval date for the shroud at the press conference, he made no mention of the fact that the protocols to ensure a definitive test had been abandoned. His only comment was, There was a million pound business in making forgeries during the 14th century. Someone just got a bit of linen, faked it up and flogged it. He did not acknowledge that the result conflicted with a wealth of evidence that suggested a much older date or that the Shroud has no equivalent from the Middle Ages or any other period, and no one can explain or replicate the image upon it. For an increasingly sceptical and secular world, in this moment, and by default, the Shroud of Turin was consigned to a future of relative obscurity. If you know little of it, then the moment of this announcement is the only reason why. Fortunately, some researchers have not been deterred. Dr. Thomas de Weslow, a Cambridge art expert, has shown in great detail how unlikely the shroud is to be medieval. Among many other discoveries, John Jackson, former head of Sturb and his team, using a cloth with the features of the shroud transferred to it, has shown how it could have wrapped a body. Right down to the bloodstains on the soles of the feet,
The most striking characteristic of the image is that it lies on the surface fibrils only. It does not penetrate the cloth beyond a few nanometers. The closest anyone has come today to replicating an image with the same chemical and physical characteristics is Italy's National Agency for New Technologies. Scientists there, led by physicist Dr. Paolo De Lazaro, conducted five years of experiments using state-of-the-art eczema lasers to train short bursts of ultraviolet light on raw linen in an effort to simulate the image's coloration. They are close, but could never replicate a full human figure. The ultraviolet light necessary to create this image exceeds the maximum power released by all ultraviolet light sources available today. It would require pulses having durations shorter than 40 billionth of a second and intensities of the order of several billion watts to discolor the cloth without penetrating and destroying it. If the most advanced technologies available in the 21st century could not produce a facsimile of the shroud image, how could it have been executed by a medieval forger? Unbelievable as it seems, the best available explanation for the way the image was transferred to the cloth is a burst of radiation emanating from a body. Is that unscientific? Within the bounds of our understanding today, yes. Does that make it a miracle? Or is it something we simply do not yet understand? In the words of one writer, only this much is certain. The Shroud of Turin is either the most awesome and instructive relic of Jesus in existence, or it is the most ingenious, most unbelievably clever product of the human mind and hand on record. It is one or the other. There is no middle ground. Which is right? Who is he? There's no doubt that if the image purported to be a pharaoh, a warrior, an emperor, or any other historical figure, the world of academia would not rest until they could understand it. Is Jesus of Nazareth too potent a figure for a scholar to tangle with? Too dangerous to reputations? What are they scared of? What might there be to lose or gain by confronting its challenges? The biggest event the Shroud has seen outside Turin for centuries took place in the UK in the summer of 2015, when Barry Schwartz, the recognized official chronicler of the Shroud, was invited to address an Ahmadiyya Islamic event in Britain. It gives me great pleasure to invite him to our Jalsa Salana and request him to come and say a few words. As I stand here and I look at your motto, love for all and hatred for none, I can only look at myself as a shining example of your creed that the Ahmadiyya community would invite a Jewish man to discuss a Christian relic at a Muslim organization. <laughs> and so I'm very grateful. The image of the man on the shroud is devoid of anything that would allow any one sect or denomination to claim it or him as their own, or validate anyone's narrow or exclusive interpretation. It is a unique and devastating depiction of a man who has suffered a Roman crucifixion, but somehow, somehow, seems to have transcended its horrors. There's plenty of scope for debate about almost every aspect because it remains a scientific, forensic, and historical enigma. It could be the most sacred of mysteries. With all the suffering in the world, could there be a better image to remind us of our shared humanity? A humanity that he also shared. Look closer, deeper, and make up your own mind.